And what I would sort of advocate is that basically we have to be part of that. And there's a way that people take themselves out of the game early on where they say, I, I call it the perfect standard. And the idea is that you have to, it's a myth. To be able to make a stand, you need to know everything about an issue. You have to be able to answer every question. You have to have it all mapped out. You have to be the most eloquent, competent, visionary, inspiring activist ever on the planet in the combination of King, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Wonder Woman, Superman, and all other people in it. You know, just nobody's going to But you got to be that. And one of the things that I think happens then is that people sort of say, oh, well, you know, I just can't. As opposed to, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to learn as I go. The other, you know, the other thing is it actually applies often to politics, where you say, well, here's this person, and I, you know, maybe I worked really hard to, to try and get him elected, you know, but there's now another candidate won the primary, so I'm going to stay home. You know, it's, it, because it's not, it's, not, it's not perfection, it's simply reality. These are the choices. And so what I'm advocating is jumping in in a messy world. You know, and so the one example that I give is the Rosa Parks story, where people think that you know Parks just jumped out of nowhere on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and single-handedly started the civil rights movement, did it all by herself, uh, kind of on a whim, you know, her her. And I, I use that as an example because most people don't really know the actual story. Um, they don't know that she's part of a community. She's been part of the NAACP for a dozen years. Uh, she's a secretary. She's like, done a lot of work trying to get people coming to meetings. Just curious if any, anybody's ever tried to get somebody to come to a meeting, just raise your hand. You know, <laughs> most of us have. You know, very little gets accomplished without people meeting together. And you know that doesn't happen unless people are bugging each other to come for meetings. But it's not going to be the glamorous stuff that makes the headlines. They're like, oh, Rosa Parks. She's, getting, she's calling somebody up. You know, she's bugging them. This is going to make history, folks. You don't see that. You just see that moment later on. You don't see everything else that led up to it. She is also, you know, again, part of this community. There's a guy named Edie Nixon who's a union organizer. So they call it the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. They take people's suitcases on the trains. And largely African American Union. He's the head of the NAACP chapter in Montgomery. And He's the person who gets a young and reluctant Martin Luther King involved. And you know, you might think, oh, well, you know, he's Martin Luther King, of course he's gonna get involved. But, but that's not the case. He's very hesitant. He's making excuses. He's saying, well, I'm young, I'm new in town, people don't really know me, I'm just getting started. I mean, they all had elements of truth because most perfect standard excuses have some elements of truth. But, you know, they're excuses. And finally, Nixon prevails on King to get involved, and that's where the world first hears of me. So what's important to me is that just, you know, here it is, even these giants of history, they're still facing the barriers that everybody else faces. The second element that I was talking about with Parks is what I call intentionality. Because to be able to, to make change, you kind of need to do two things. One is, you got to take a leap of faith. I, I like the, um, the phrase that Jim Walsh writes that. Christian Social Justice Magazine Sojourner says, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change by your actions. You know, so here's something, you just think it's impossible. I mean, you know, you couldn't get a $15 an hour minimum wage, but people organize and suddenly it happens. You couldn't stop the Keystone Pipeline, but people organize and it happens. So you know, in most situations, you're trying to be up against something and it just seems impossible and then you do it and then change happens. And so, you know, when I, when I look at that, I think, okay, that's essential. And then right next to it is what I call intentionality, which is just the practical stuff. So in you know, Parks' case, she had taken training sessions at a place called Highlander Center in Tennessee the summer before her arrest. King would go there as well. They met with other civil rights activists in an earlier generation. They're being strategic. She didn't plan that day to get arrested. But the moment she made that choice, she knew they were going to organize a campaign and they didn't know if it was going to succeed or not. So, you know, you jump in, you take the leap of faith, you don't wait for the perfect standard, but then you got to do things. You got to do things like in this case, 
how do you get people to work if they're not going to ride the bus because they had a boycott for a year? Well, they had to come up with carpools, but not a lot of people had cars because it was a poor community. So anyway, they really had to reach out and organize. They had to coordinate all the schedules, you know, without laptops, computers, any of the, you know, cell phones, any of the stuff that, you know, that we take for granted now. Um, but they did that. I, my project, the Campus and Election Engagement Project, we worked to get colleges and universities to take institutional responsibility for getting students involved in elections. And so, you know, here's our goal, which is get people to vote. Here's, you know, where we are, which is like, okay, you've got this institution, and then it's all the practicalities. How do you help people register? What's, you know, what, what are the rules in Florida or Ohio or Virginia or North Carolina or the states that we're working in? Um, I don't have terrible new voting laws. How do you navigate people past that? So this now works. Okay, great. Um, say if it'll save my voice. Um, you know, all those kinds of practicalities. We come up with nonpartisan candidate guides because students often say, you know, I don't know who to vote for, um, I don't know enough to research it out. Um, so we have a list, we just go down the issues and we show this is the contrast between the candidates on immigration policy, climate, renewable energy, abortion, foreign policy, just all the different issues. And so without those practicalities, nothing happens. And so whatever it is that you're doing, whatever goal, you know, the cause, whatever the goal, you've got to figure out intentionally, doesn't mean you know everything. I remember I, 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 a staffer was running our project one of the years, and he really good planner, and he helped us get a lot more organized and be a lot more intentional about stuff. And then at some point, he said, boy, everything's happening differently than I expected. And I said, well, welcome to the world. This is the way it is. There are always things going to come up differently. It's never going to be exactly how you mapped it out. But if you strategize and you plan out as best you can, you're going to be in better shape. And so that's the, you know, that's the challenge, is to kind of have that balance, of not waiting for the perfect moment, but also then figuring out, all right, how are we going to do what we're trying to accomplish, and doing that in whatever ways we can. And that drops out of the conventional story if you just think it's a woman who came out of nowhere because her feet hurt. Third element is persistence. I mentioned Parks had been involved in the NAACP 12 years before stand on the bus. So if she doesn't, say she drops out in year three or five or seven or 10, we never hear of her. You got whatever it is, you got to keep on even when you're going to hit the wall. It, you know, it may mean that, you know, there's a day where you're just, the best thing you can do is just, you know, go down by the water and, you know, look at the sound or I go for a run or um, my friend Pete who teaches here, he can do it since, you know, we go running together. Um, and it's like, yeah, you got all these stresses, you've got, you know, issues. Suddenly they kind of melt away and you go back the next day. But that's different from bailing. It's different from saying, okay, I'm just, you know, I'm giving up. Because it's when you give up that nothing happens. So that to me, I'm just curious how many people knew the core of the Rosa Parks story before I mentioned it. Just raise your hands. More than most, but only about half. You know. Oh, for my book. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well that kind of not counting not counting reading it in my books. Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess, yeah, they have to, they have to go down before we take that, that segment out. That's what we get in most schools, you know. So, so basically, yeah, that's part of the story. You know, the other part of the story is you don't know who you're going to engage when you, when you, and to me, that's really powerful. So, I, I look at Parks, and how'd you get involved? Well, her husband founded the, co-founded co the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama. Just a regular person, he's a barber, you know, nothing fancy. And when he gets involved, he helps get her involved. But what I don't know, what nobody's, you know, is that I've read, is how did Raymond Parks get involved? We don't really know that exactly, but there are probably people he had a conversation with who gave him courage to act, because you could have been killed at that point for speaking out, people were. And those people aren't going to be in the history books, but they're part of the stream, because without them, you don't have Raymond Parks. Without Raymond, maybe you don't have Rosa. Without Rosa, you don't have the stand on the bus. And you know, maybe history turns out a little bit differently. So, I always think of that. You know, give, give you an example. Um, well, I asked this in the last uh, session. How many people know where Obama first got politically active? You want to guess? Just shout it out. In Chicago. Yeah, that's what most people think. Any other guesses? Hawaii. <laughs> Why is the other way? <laughs> yeah, okay, so, no, actually it wasn't either of those. So here's the deal. And it's an example of the kind of chains 
of interactions that can happen. So there was a guy who was a Green Beret in Vietnam who came back disillusioned with the war, I can Gary Chapman. And he comes back, goes to a community college in Los Angeles. I can't remember which one. He's just part of the LA City Community College system. And then he transfers to a four-year called, small four-year called Occidental. And at that point, there was this big movement to get schools to pull out of any investments or pensions or whatever in companies that were doing business in South Africa. And it was a way of putting business pressure on the, on the apartheid government in the same way that there's a movement to divest from fossil fuels, and like Seattle as a municipality is now, was one of the first cities to divest from fossil fuels. Um, you know, and then a lot of institutions have been doing that lately with a lot of pressure. And so he, he organizes this group, and they get the student government to support him, and they get the faculty senate, which is not always easy, they get them to support him. And then the president and the trustees just stonewalling, maybe they had you know, ties to some of those same companies that were you know, doing business in South Africa. And Chapman graduates with, in a sense, his effort having failed, because you know, they schooled in the best. And the, some people who are part of that group continue it on the next semester. And the next semester, he graduates in June, and the next semester in September, a young man from Hawaii named Barack Obama comes to the campus. And he gets involved in that group, meaning, not meaning he's a leader, he's not. He's at the periphery, he speaks along with other speakers in one rally, but in retrospect, he looks back and sort of sees it as a kind of turning point that then leads him to get more involved in different issues, and then he ends up in Chicago doing community organizing, and then you know the rest of the story. And what's interesting to me is, you know, what everyone thinks about Obama as a president, good, bad, or mixed. The idea that because you started a group to work on an issue, or because you continued a group that somebody else started, or because you reached out as part of a group to somebody, and that person went on to be president of the United States, I don't know, that, I, I think that's pretty interesting, you know, because you just don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, that's, you know, there aren't that many presidents, so it's not going to happen that often. <laughs> but it's still pretty powerful. Because you just don't really know who you're going to bring in. You know? and, and to me, because you know, this work is hard, it's another reason to be able to, to, to act. You know, is that that person, you get involved, they could just go on to do something totally amazing. And you know, they're probably not going to be president, they're probably not going to win the Nobel Prize. But they might very well end up being, you know, a huge, you know, huge community activist. You know, Pete and I are hanging out, you know, say, oh, just look at the paper, oh, that was somebody in my class. You know, they're involved, you know, they're involved in this cool community group, they're involved in that kind of cool community group. You know, and that stream happens, it's central, it happens a lot. You know, so that's, that's part of it. Part of it is that you also don't know who you're going to reach. So I use this example, there's a young woman I profile named Angie, Angie DeSoto, who, she, when she started out, wasn't, to say she wasn't the most engaged student was probably an understatement. So her first, I asked her one point, her first election, if she was at all involved, this was 2004, it was a really close election between George Bush and John Kerry. She was in Virginia, Virginia Tech, which was a swing state, you know, where, you know, where you just don't know, and Virginia could have, well, who would have swung the election had it gone a different way. Um, and she said, no, I just didn't think it was president had any impact on my life. And then she got really embarrassed. And she said, well, we actually did a drinking game. So it was a residential campus. And so a bunch of the young women in our hall, they divided into red teams and blue teams, red Republican, blue Democrat. And when a um, state went red, the red team chugged a beer. And when a state went blue, the blue team chugged a beer. And as you know, there are 50 states. This is a serious amount of beer. <laughs> By the end of the evening, they're just like, you know, they're on the floor. And, you know, that was not exactly highly engaged. <laughs> and so what happens? She ends up being in a class, a geology class, where the prof kind of takes a risk and talks about climate change, even though it's not dead central to geology. Um, but he just said, this isn't about the test. This is about your future. This is going to affect everything. And it goes through the science and the overwhelming consensus of the scientists. I mean, you know, there's this handful of people who the, you know, denied, the cigarette companies paid them to deny any link between smoking and cancer. And then the companies that made these spray propellants when they're dealing with the ozone successfully with threats to the ozone layer, um, they denied that. And then they deny any links to global climate change. 
But you know, there are these teeny handful of people funded by Exxon and the coal companies, and all the other scientists are saying, you know, this is real, this is terrifying, this is proceeding far faster than we had thought, and you know, we better do something about it. And, she, and Angie doesn't really know what to do exactly, so she reads, she learns a little bit, and then she runs into this tiny uh, environmental group, like four people on a 30,000 person campus. And she gets really involved. It turns out she's a really gifted organizer. And she ends up growing those four people to, the, their list serve ended up with 1,400 people. It was the largest group of any kind on the campus, in a political or not. Uh, and they get this, the um, president to do a sort of comprehensive sustainability initiative where they just look at you know, the, the lighting, the heat, the cooling, the, you know, every, every facet of the physical facilities and, and make a lot of changes. But they, they end up, when she graduates, they hire her to be their first sustainability coordinator for the campus. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, I was, she said, I'm proof that people can change. I was a drunken party girl. You know, that was who I was. I'm not there anymore. And this school's proof things can change. You know, it's a much more engaged campus. And what's interesting to me is that were it not for those four people, you could argue that they weren't they weren't that successful, they wouldn't have ended up in a four-person group. And so maybe they weren't that good as an organizer, but that they hadn't approached her when, she's, when she was walking across the quad, none of that would have happened. So to me, it's really hardening. So, so, to, so I think knowing that is important. Now, the other facet is mentioned what I do is I do a lot of work elections and, and think about it, we have to be really nonpartisan as, as an organization because we're asking the schools to take institutional stands and a school can't support a particular candidate. I mean, it's meant that I sort of end up using my own personal political voice for that reason. Um, but as I'm thinking about things, it's a very interesting election because right now you've got two, I would say, the odds of Hillary being the candidate on the Democratic side are 90 to 95% after these last round of elections. And the odds of Trump being are less, but there's still maybe two thirds. Um, or at least this, you know, this is what people are saying at, at, at this point. And if you look at who young voters have voted for, it's overwhelmingly not those candidates. You know, by like, you know, three or four to one, sometimes eight to one in some states. You know, so I think this is a really interesting split because, you know, your preferred candidate isn't going to be the one who's not. <coughs> are you going to show up or not? And it's, it's troubled me because I've had people say, you know, well, I'm just not voting for X person. And I'm like, you know, one of them is going to be president. One of them is going to pick a Supreme Court justice that's going to decide issues on everything from campaign finance to the environment to immigration rights to anything that affects everybody. And, you know, there's this choice. And opting out just means you're essentially empowering the one who you like least. And you know, and it's a kind of bearing to the perfect standard. And so then people also say, well, you know, just, you know, well, what's one vote? Five vote doesn't really matter. And I, I think of a couple of examples, just real personal ones here from, from my own experience, where in, in 2004, we have a governor's race coming up this, this fall. In 2004, there was a close governor's race. And I was, I was paying mostly attention nationally. I wasn't paying that much attention to it. But on election day, I canvassed the neighborhood in Ballard for the, my preferred candidate. And I got three people to vote. One of them forgot it was election day. One of them needed a ride to the polls. It was before we switched to mail-in ballots. And one of them had an absentee ballot and didn't know, like, you know, okay, what do I do? How do I get it to count uh, when I forgot to mail it? So none of, how to describe it, none of what I did was dependent on my own skills or eloquence or persuasive powers. It was just like, if anybody else had walked the exact same route, they would have the exact same three people with the exact same three conversations. And so I was like, okay, great, I got three people, you know, busted ass for eight, eight hours. I guess that's worth something. And then, what happens? It's 134 votes after three recounts. And I just do the math huh. for the governor's race, the entire state of Washington. And I think, okay, so I got 150th of them on that day. Huh. And my candidate happened to win. And if 50 fewer people had shown up on our side, she would have lost. 50 more people had shown up to get out the precincts on the other side, he probably would have won. That's not many, 50 people have lost less than in this room. 
And it just really brought it home to me, that power, which, you know, which one can do as a volunteer. You don't actually even have to be you know, eligible to vote yourself. I mean, you can, you know, you'd want to explain to people why you care about a particular election. But you can do that as an international student. You can do that as a, you know, as a non-citizen, you know, even if you're undocumented. You know, it's just a question of, you know, you're a volunteer, you're talking to people, you're making the case for this candidate or the other candidate. And all of that's you know perfectly legal, and, and and you know you could be the person who gets the three votes, you know that day. I mean I've been doing other stuff other days. I got other you know other votes, and it just brought it home. The other thing that brought it home to me, and this sort of ties in the, the elections with the um, that sort of sense of you never know what you bring in, is um, back last year there was a city council candidate with a friend of mine, named, a woman named Lisa Herbold, and I lived in West Seattle, so she was running in my district. And she'd been a long time aide to Nick Mercado, who was a friend, who might be a really good city council person. And she asked me if I could do a house party. And I was like, well, you know, I'm really busy with this election project, but, you know, you know, so I can't promise much, but I can send out some emails, and my wife can send out some emails. And she's like, you know, that would, you know, every little bit helps. That would, be, that would be great. So, you know, we do, and, you know, we invite our neighbors, and we invite our friends, and, we figured we'd get 20, 25 people. You know, maybe we maybe also raise a couple hundred bucks for her, you know, she get 10 bucks a piece or something. And we got five. And you know, it was like pitiful. <laughs> and like, God, I've wasted an hour of Lisa's time and her campaign manager's time, you know, to come to talk to five people. One person gave 25 bucks. That was it. <laughs> you know, I think it was just like, this did not cost out. And I was feeling really bummed. I was like, I'm sorry, Lisa, I tried. You know, and but one of the people, a friend of mine named Chef, who he'd been working with, I uh, did some rotational programs for the Seattle School District. He happened, to, he happened to have just retired, so he had some time on his hands, and he threw himself into the um, into that campaign, and he became, I guess, I call it super volunteer. So that was like his job. I mean, you know, self-appointed. It's like, yeah, canvas a neighborhood, make some phone calls, knock on doors, and you know, he was doing that for three, three and a half months. There's no question that when they finally finished all those recounts of it, recounts, she trailed on election night and then pulled ahead, and it turned out to be 39 votes for a city council race. There's no question that she you know, accounted for more than 39 votes. I mean, you know, if you're working for three months and you're energetic, you're going to account for more than that. And I was just like, oh, so I guess my party wasn't, you know, the house party. <laughs> I guess it wasn't such a bad thing after all. You know, because he wouldn't have been involved. He was asking all these questions, of, you know, and there you know, they're really thoughtful questions. He's a thoughtful guy, and um, so that you know, that was that was the context, and um, you know, so I look at that and I'm just like, okay, you never know, you never know who the person you bring in might end up to doing something, you know, seriously, you know, impactful. So that to me, that's that's a lesson to remember. And then the other thing, and I've got a few more things I want to cover, but is I had a really great question in the last in the last session, and somebody said, "Well, you know, how do you respond if people like if, if what you really want is fundamental change, and if the candidates that you're handling don't represent that, you know, what do you do?" And I was thinking about it. And I said, "Well, you know, to me, it's like it's like a carpenter's toolbox. You know, you got a hammer, you got a drill, you got a saw, you got some other stuff, and." You don't build a house just with a hammer, or with a saw, or with a drill, or with anything else. The tools work together. And so to me, the elections are a critical tool. Somebody in any given election is going to be president, governor, senator, mayor, congressperson. I mean, that stuff matters hugely. And then in between them, it's not like the world stops. You have a chance to push. You have a chance to... to steer a candidate in a different direction. And one of the examples I use is kind of interesting is you know people follow the Keystone pipeline that basically tar sands are these incredibly dirty fuel source coming down from Canada. And they were building a pipeline, not even for the US use, they're going to export it. And it was a sweetheart deal and they pumped in tons of money. They even what did they do? Uh, Trans Canada was the name of the company and they, they would go to all the like local elected officials on the route and they would say Oh, we might want to need. To, we might want to have to uh, store some equipment. Could we pay some outrageous sum to like rent your front porch or your back closet or your backyard or you know this little two, you know? 
I mean, just basically bribery, but they did it in a way that wasn't quite technically bribery. And, you know, they bought up all the TV time. I mean, just, you know, they had a lot of money at stake. So they weren't, you know, they weren't taking anything for granted. And, you know, it was going to roll through. And everybody knew that. And the initial studies out of the State Department were like, okay, yeah, it's fine. Because they had a company that was close to TransCanada. And then this friend of mine happened to live in Nebraska where I was going through it. She's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I got to do something. So she did this really radical action of holding a house party, um, you know, a potluck. And she got like five people to come. I mean, they were only hoping for four or five people, so that was okay. And they just, you know, they talked and they came up with some ideas. There's somebody from the Sierra Club and a couple other groups. And they just started reaching out. And then they found this, you know, they started building some momentum. This guy was this just rock whip conservative Republican, looked like John Wayne Cowboy <coughs> movie, a uh, guy named Randy Thompson. And he was, his land was in the path of it. And he's like, I am not going to be bullied. This is my land. This is my family's land. I'm not going to sell these people. And so they did these life-size cutouts of him, and the slogan was like, we'll, we stand with Randy. And they made it the symbol of the campaign, because Nebraska is a conservative state. And it just started building momentum. And at one point, there was this, um, Nebraska doesn't have any pro sports teams, or at least not major league. So Cornhuskers football is like a really big thing. And so there was, you know, I don't know, 60,000 people gathered in the University of Nebraska Stadium. And TransCanada, of course, has bought an ad because that's what they do. You know, there's the ad. And suddenly the every stadium erupts in booze. And like, this is not part of the change plan. And I was like, this is the point that we thought we were starting to turn. And then meanwhile, all these people are getting arrested at the White House to pressure Obama, lots of them wearing Obama gear. And so eventually what happens is Obama stops the pipeline, but only after this huge amount of pressure. You know, it takes both, you know. And I'm not sure that the other can presidential candidate, Mitt Romney, wouldn't have stopped the pipeline. Because he would just, you know, his base wasn't the environmental community. He wasn't as receptive. It wouldn't have been his people, you know, it would have been somebody else's people protesting. And, you know, I don't really care about them. Um, you know, or you do, but not, you know, you're not taking them quite as seriously. So, to me, it's a great example of just kind of how the things fit together. And so that, you know, sort of when people say that to me, my answer is, yeah, you do both. You show up, you know, you elect the best possible candidates at every point in the process, and then you keep on acting. And then, just looping back on one of my other themes, how do you keep on doing it for your life? You do it by persevering. And I use the example of Desmond Tutu, um, you know, the Peace Prize from South Africa. And, you know, you think about his life, I mean, being a black man in apartheid South Africa, not fun. I mean, you know, you're getting daily humiliations. You can't go to this beach, this park, this school. You know, you got to explain that to your kids. I mean, it really rips you apart. I mean, we went through that. You know, we won the models for apartheid was segregation in the U.S. South. So, I mean, we have that in our past as well. And, you know, we still have some legacies like, you know, a third of, third? yeah, a third of the African American men in Florida, a quarter of all African Americans in Florida can't vote. It's a million and a half people disenfranchised because you know they do felon stuff and combined with the drug laws, one of the reasons I think liberalization is really important that you know we passed here. And all of a sudden you've got these people, they may not even go to jail ever, but you know, you get busted, cop a plea and suddenly you can't ever vote. Uh, you know, pretty ugly stuff. So it's not like it's completely passed. But in you know South Africa it was pretty blatant. And Tutu had friends murdered, tortured, imprisoned for decades. You know, it was pretty harsh. And they finally have, they finally, with the help of people, globally, they overthrow that, you know, just a horribly abusive system. And Tutu is the chair of what they call the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is you're drawing together the stories, you're telling the stories of the crimes committed after apartheid. You know, and the deal was is if you testified, you would get amnesty, but if you didn't, you would be prosecuted. And so, um, month after month, in every language, they're broadcasting on every network. And Tutu's the chair of it, and it's just these horrible stories. And you just have to think like, you know, at some point you would just feel like, God, I've done enough with humanity. I'm just gonna kind of kick back and retire. But that isn't really how he is. So, there were these massacres in Rwanda a number of years ago where people were like literally hacking each other apart with machetes. And, so he goes there to try and bring some healing to that scarred land. And he's 
there's an election in Haiti that's he's an election observer, and they steal the election, and there's riots, and he's trying to get people to keep on protesting, but you know, but not be rioting, and they have helicopters flying people out, the observers for their safety. He's like, no, I gotta be here with my people. So you know, he's always throwing himself into the hardest situation. Spoke out passionately against the Iraq War from the beginning, you know, as long as it's continued. Um, Climate change, he says there's three billion reasons to act. The three billion poorest people in the world have done nothing to create it. You know, it's the richer countries. But, you know, they're going to bear the brunt because they've got the least resources and they're in a lot of the climate zones that are most affected. So you look at all that and you just think, boy, this would probably be somebody who's kind of seen too much bad news, you know, too much of that ugly side of humanity. And you just kind of like, you know, I can't. You just think you would just be kind of down. But if you've seen him, yeah, we're lucky. He has some ties to Seattle, like people who are protégés of his. So he's come through here more than he has other cities of our size. And so I've been lucky enough to see him four, I think four times. And what's interesting is that he's, he's really joyful. He's having a really good time. He's sort of almost like, I say like he floats off the stage. It's the only way to describe it. He's just laughing and joking and talking to people. And you can just tell he's enjoying himself. And he always, at one point, he would always just tell a joke. And like sometimes a really silly one. I remember he said, well, who would think the world would learn anything from South Africa or not the brightest country? A scientist said that they would go and walk into the sun. And uh, when people pointed out that it would burn up, they said, oh, no, we'll launch it at night. It'll be fine. It'll be OK. You know, and then he goes on to talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I remember, like, sitting there thinking, as I'm laughing, like, God, why am I laughing? You know, and like, you know, shouldn't he be talking about something more serious than this kind of corny joke? And then I get it. It's like he's trying to remind us to laugh. That is really important. And if you're dealing with stuff that's really serious and, you know, possibly lives that are at stake and futures are at stake, that's all the more reason to, to, to be laughing. You know, you, you know it, it, it's important. And so, you know, I got that finally. And then I remember the other time I saw him, it was a uh, benefit for South Avenue project in Los Angeles. And yeah, we got a, a, a sheet of folks going to be on my email that's going to circulate um, around um, and I get my updates and work that I'm doing. And so basically, he was not feeling that well together. He laid down for a nap before he gave us talks, some other people spoke, and then some music starts playing and people start dancing. And I look over, there's Desmond Tutu just dancing away. And I'm thinking, God, I've never seen a Nobel Peace Prize winner dance, uh, but much less an archbishop. This is pretty interesting. And so the lesson that I took back is this is somebody who's like, he's got you know, as fierce a sense of justice as anybody on this planet, certainly made as much an impact as anyone on this planet. But he also knows that like, you know, you've got to seize those good moments. So you've got to see the, you know, the good food, the good you know, conversation, the, you know, whatever it is, the humor. I mean, you know, we live in this beautiful area of the country. You know, and my, you know, when I'm just totally running ragged, you know, I go out for a run, and it, it heals me. You know, I go look at the, you know, the, the water. I mean, that kind of stuff is so important for us because it allows you to keep on as opposed to go through and, and burn out. So what I want to do is spend like I've got 20 more minutes for kind of questions and conversation is to end at that point, but just to sort of challenge everybody to you know take those steps of getting involved, you know, even though your time is sprayed and you know you have lots of other demands, and just see where it leads, because it can lead to powerful change and it can lead to, to all sorts of possibilities that you never really thought of. Uh, and when enough people do it, that's what changes the society. You know, thanks. Yeah, dude, this, this Pete Knudsen, all, one of my oldest friends and uh, illustrious anthropology prop here. <laughs> and just a quick quip. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the role of Seattle Central students in terms of the social change history yeah. and community uh, in the Seattle area? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, this has been, I, I would argue that historically, at least in the last 20 years, I'm going to say. Because Central, Central started out as a lot smaller. But since Central started, you know, growing the size that it was, this has probably been the most active school in Seattle. So in other words, I would say, you know, more has happened here because of social change than happens at the U, even though the U is much bigger and 
you know, as residential schools and students who have more time on their hands because they're more affluent, you know. Um, Seattle was pretty active. But there's been a lot. I mean, like, so we had, like, during the WTO protests with the World Trade Organization, um, you know, Seattle was one of the centers, the centers of organizing on an effort that really did make kind of national headlines and, um, or international headlines, really, you know, all over the world. And I think that there's a tradition of engagement here, but it's, it's really important that people seize it. And, and that also, I think, I mean, this is where I sort of talked about the toolbox earlier, that I have had this sort of, well, this is not just here, but frustrating situation for people where they really do feel like, oh, I'm just discarding the hammer. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna do the non-electoral stuff, I'm gonna protest, we're gonna, you know, I'll be part of the, you know, Black Lives Matter march, we'll come up here, I'll march on, on policing and, you know, abuse of power by the police will start from here, but I'm not gonna vote because, you know, that's too corrupted. And so, I think if I'm gonna stay with the tradition is here, it's a significant tradition of engagement that should be built on, but sometimes it does throw away some of the tools of power that it has. Um, and to me, they all work together. So that, that, that's my take on it. I mean, other folks might have, might have different ones, but this has really been, you know, a significant center for social change. You know, because if you think about it, I mean, this, you know, this, the range of people brought together here, you know, is so diverse. It's, you know, it really spans everyone. It's not just the, you know, the sort of new layer of wealth that's come into our city in the last, you know, 10 to 20 years. It really stands everybody. And, and I think that that creates a really firm mix. You know, I think that's happened to push people to get involved and, you know, kind of offer their own models. And that helps. And students have done that. So I think, I think it's come from very, you know, to make something happen, it has to come from various angles of approach. Don't be shy. I'll call, I'll call people in a minute. Um, yeah. Um, can you give us information, like an update on what's happening with the coal train um, struggle that the coal, tra the coal train? You know, honestly, I'm not sure. You know, I think you probably have as much an update. I mean, I get the among the millions of things going into my email boxes of the you know the people who are working on that coalition. You know, basically, I mean, the the context is this, which is that. Um, the, you know, coal is the most carbon intensive fuel. And so people have been really focusing on limiting it as a way of tackling climate change. And the US, and the US, led particularly by groups like the Sierra Club, there's been a real, I mean, highly successful campaign to not license new coal plants and to close down old ones. And it's coincided with this spectacular vote drop in cost and growth in, in adoption of renewable energy. So the, you know, globally, the predominant source of new energy this last year, I think last two years, has been renewables. Because suddenly, it's actually more competitive to use solar or wind than it is to burn coal, which is a, you know, which is a total game changer. And the adoption rates of renewable technologies are exceeding the curve of the adoption rates of cell phones. I mean, that's the comparison that gets made. You know, so, so every, you know, every new technology kind of has this takeoff point that looks like this. And you know, we think, well, cell phones. But they weren't at a certain point. And it was a slower curve and then it starts taking off. So now, granted, the cell phones, they didn't have this, a huge industry, well, the fossil fuel industry, fighting them and undermining them. But, but you know, so that's really hard. And so part of what's happened then is coal places are trying to export them because the demand here has been dropping. And so the fight is over whether or not to allow our ports to be export terminals. And, you know, that's an important fight because if you can stop that, then it becomes much harder to market the coal. In the same way with the Keystone Pipeline, where they could still get some of it to market, but it was harder and more costly. And the harder and more costly it makes it, the less likely they're going to take it out of the ground. And so that's the, so I don't have any, immediate updates on that that you, know, you probably get the same emails I do. But, um, but I do know that people have been really organizing and some of that, you know, you know it's, it's like earlier, last year, a year and a half ago, when they were going to be, Trichelle was going to be drilling in the Arctic. 
-hmm. And there was these, you know, they're going to be repairing the, um, the drilling rig here. And the port you know, was a done deal. And, you know, people, you know, high activists and, you know, people blockading. And everyone was like, oh, this is going to be futile. And I remember people, like, after the thing kind of left, people felt like, well, we've lost, you know, the thing, you know, it got out to sea. And I felt like, you know, that's sort of too short a horizon because, of course, there's no way you're going to physically going to be able to stop it with a kayak. The question is, what kind of context of discussion do you create around it? And what the discussion meant is that when the part was the cost of uh, the price of oil dropping, and Shell knowing that everywhere they went, they're going to have to deal with this kind of thing, they just decided it wasn't too much hassle, and they bailed on it. You know. So again, you know, interesting case of you think something's going to be a done deal, and then it isn't you know, until it isn't. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, near the beginning that these, this this lecture is, is very interesting because. Lots of young people, like some 4181, are right. not getting the candidate that they would like in either party. Is right. there any of you perhaps expand on, on your insight the political um, implications or um, uh, ramifications beyond just like certain laws being passed? Do you think it's going to, you know, perhaps change the way that we work this politics? That well, we're around? you know, it's, I mean, I think at this point, it's, you know, the story isn't yet written, so we don't really know what's going to happen. I mean, right now, like, so this is an example that, that I you know, So there's a guy who's a veteran Republican pollster named Frank Luntz. And he did a poll of young voters. And it was part of the poll he offered people a choice of 22 people, political and entertainment, and you know, other figures that they could go out and have dinner with. And they could pick three. And Barack Obama led, then Jennifer Lawrence, then Ellen DeGeneres, then Bill Gates, then Bernie Sanders. Trump was 14 and Hillary was tied for 17 out of 22. Yeah. And it was just like, I looked at that and I thought, oh shit. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a, you know, there was, there's a risk of a lot of people staying home. Because, you know, they're not even, I mean, they're just like not interested. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, as I said, you know, somebody is going to be president. Somebody's going to appoint Supreme Court justice. Somebody's going to appoint, you know, either somebody who's environmentally supportive or environmentally hostile to the head of the EPA. I mean, there are huge decisions that are going to get made. And so the decision to opt out means whoever you like least is who you're elected. Now, I don't know whether or not young voters are going to get that message. I really don't. I mean, we're trying to do that with our election project. You know, it's just say, there are, you know, it's not our job to tell you who to vote for, but there are tangible differences, and you need to sort that out where candidates stand. Because, um, you know, one way, or we'll help you sort it out. We have these, these nonpartisan candidate guides where you go down the list and all the different issues. Um, but somewhere, if people just say, my preferred person, you know, didn't make it, I didn't like the other person, then you do really get a very, you, you get an electorate that's skewed. I mean, it means that it's older voters. It means that it, because older constituencies tend to be, I mean, the younger you get, the more multiracial it is. You know, so it tends to be wider. You just, those are the people who would be picking the president there on down. And so I think the challenge is for all of us to say, you know, including those of us who, you know, maybe we aren't, you know, we aren't able to vote ourselves, but to say to the other folks, you know, look, this matters, you know, this is why, you know, because while we can't as a, as a project take stands, any individual can. You say, look, this is why I think this is really important that you elect this candidate. And maybe it's because just to defeat this other candidate. You know, that's important. That's valid. But I think, I think that that's, that's what we're dealing with. I have not seen a skew of young voters this dramatic um, before. And that's and so that means it's kind of new territory, you know. But I think it's all of, it's up to all of us to get people to participate, you know. And to recognize that you know who is Washington's governor really matters. So even if you're lukewarm about who's going to be who you're going to vote for for president, you know, this governor race, as I said, 134 votes in 2004, it could be that tight again, you know. Yeah, I think understanding. I mean, I guess over the years, I've become a whole lot less purist. I'm not sure I ever was completely purist. 
but um, I become way less so. And it's just like, okay, this is the territory we're in. And you know, and I don't think you can describe it. It doesn't mean giving up ideals. It doesn't mean you, you don't stop fighting for the big stuff. You just say, here it is, and at certain points you're gonna make decisions within a more limited, constrained frame. And at some point you're gonna to push to break out of that frame. And I think both have that both of them have their importance and have their value. Yeah. Um, I guess so why the word citizen? I mean I feel like that excludes such a immense part of yeah. people we need to be in solidarity with, like what is not a citizen? Right, 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 right. Well the way I mean when I complex. to be honest when I when I, I guess it's a little late because the book's already about the book. Yeah, 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 yeah. So originally when I was thinking about the book, I sort of thought about using the word activist. I felt like that narrowed it. And so when I said citizen, I wasn't thinking of it in terms of do you have the papers and the documents. I was thinking of just, you know, everyone is a stakeholder in a community. But that, but, you know, with that, you know, it's true that some people could construe it. On the other hand, I know that it's like, um, I remember I was teaching, I was speaking at a historically black college in Texas, and this young woman said, you know, I read your book, and um, I'm undocumented, and I'm going to, this book has inspired me to go out and, you know, and take a stand, you know, to go public as being undocumented, you know, to, to fight for, you know, for the rights of my, of my community. So, so I think in most cases, people were able to see the broader, the broader meaning of it as, as, as she was. So you were talking about how like this whole thing is about uh, encouraging people to be engaged in things that they find important. Um, and I think a lot of young people really struggle with that because of the um, scrutiny that every single post or every single statement right. that you say because everyone's so worried about being politically correct. Like you were even talking about the people out in kayaks and people were applauding them and then saying, oh wait, but you're actually in plastic and that's the thing that you're trying to avoid. And, and you know, so now all of a sudden that yeah. that narrative was changed as well. So how do you- Well, the plastic, I mean, the, you go back to the perfect standards. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. I mean, you know, the people who say, well, you're in a plastic kayak, you know, they're doing the perfect standard big time. Right. You know, you you know, you drive a car. You don't you, you know you don't live on tree bark. You know, if you're really you know if you're really committed, you would just eat tree bark. You know, <laughs> and that would you know. I mean, so we live in a complicated, contradictory world, and that's just the world we're living in. And so to be able to say, but I, and I see this all the time. I mean, you know, social media sniping always escalates. But you know, you see like, well, you know, you're obviously a hypocrite because of X, Y, Z. That is the voice of somebody who's arguing against participation. It needs to be labeled as such. You know, and sometimes people can do that, you know, well meaning. They just haven't thought it through. I mean, I remember like I was oh, I was speaking at um, a school in Rochester, and there's or not in Rochester, I was speaking at an hour north, hour south of Rochester, New York, and Annie DeFranco, who was that's not this young guy who was active in climate change, and you know, Annie DeFranco was his favorite musician on my two. And she was going to be playing like in Rochester an hour away. It's like, well, I can't go because I'd have to drive. You know, and it's like, go. You know, she's going to charge you up. She's going to energize you. Go see Annie DeFranco, and then come back and work hard for climate change. And that's, you know, that's going to be worth the, you know, whatever the number of gallons that it was to get you to that. You know, carpool, get a ride if you can, but it is just too far to walk. And you know, you know. So what's your choice? You know, it's too cold. You know, so you, you know, you do. You, I think, I think it's it's part of challenging the purism. You know, you know, and you just, you know, and, and I think it's worth labeling. You know, constructively, nicely saying, you know, this is what you're really saying is that unless a person just, you know, yeah, you know, lives in a cave that's tree bark, that you know, we're not going to listen to them. It's a complicated world. Yeah. Well, no, no, so another thing that I'm saying is that, you know, that say a school like this, there's a lot of international students. There's also students who are undocumented. So those two groups of folks can't vote, you know. But they can still, if you really care about an election, you can still volunteer with the campaign. And there may be, I'm not sure on voter registration whether there's laws that you have to be, you know, legally registered yourself. Legal voters would know that, or you know, outside there. 
But you can still volunteer. I mean, like, I, my first volunteer in a political campaign, I was 12, and I went down to stuff some envelopes. Obviously, I couldn't vote because I was 12 years old, but I could still stuff some envelopes and, you know, be modest, you know, or at least feel like I was modest and useful. So that's what I would say. It's just that, that, you know, the circle, that just because you're not a legal voter here doesn't mean that you couldn't be involved in some way if you want to. And we need people who speak different languages to help get people registered who don't speak English. Yeah. So going into communities. Well, we and have that, yeah, and that's here. huge. Going into communities of color to register yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah, like translators, where it's like, you know, you know, you don't, it's not really fair to make the kids translate, but if you've got somebody coming into a community that, you know, that speaks a certain language and, you know, doesn't speak English, but would be eligible, you know, that would be really helpful. You know, so lots of different ways. With that, I want you to join me in thanking Paul for coming. You know, and at 2 o'clock, there will also be another section called Teaching for Community Engagement. Um, it's going to be here in this room, so if you are free at 2, it's for instructors, um, staff, and students. So if you're interested, thank you for being here, and I hope to see you there. Again, thank you, Paul. Yeah, yeah, it was a very conversational, absolutely. Yeah. yeah.